In this three-part series, we are going to take a deep dive into the Flak 38 anti-aircraft gun, looking at its ammunition, magazines, and finally how the weapon itself was used. In this first video, we will be discussing ammunition. The cartridge this weapon fired is known as the 20 by 138 belted. It was developed between the wars by Solothurn, a Swiss subsidiary of Rheinmetall. Arms restrictions placed on Germany after World War I prevented Rheinmetall from developing it inside Germany themselves. Now there are three broad categories of cartridges that were manufactured for the Flak 38, high explosive, armor piercing, and training or practice. We are going to look at one of each from my collection, and I'll also tell you about some of the variations you may encounter. High explosive could be considered the standard Flak 38 round. It was used to shoot at low-flying aircraft, but could also be employed against ground targets. My shell is the earlier type, made from 1936 through 1940. It has a glossier paint and a copper driving band. Later shells used a mild steel driving band and were painted a more matte color. The manufacture of earlier shells like mine was more complicated and they utilized a screw-in tracer component. Production was simplified with the projectiles becoming boat-tailed and the tracer component pressed into the bottom of the shell. Now my shell still has a bit of tracer remaining in the bottom and you can see how it would be placed in this little cup and then screwed in. Now if we look at the shell you'll notice a number of markings. On the side here we have a 1939 date of production the weight of the shell in grams, and a Waffenopt proof mark. Now, early in the war, these shells came in two tracer colors. You had red and yellow. Since the body of the shell was already yellow to indicate high explosive, shells with yellow tracers had no extra band added. Shells with red tracers would have a red band added right above the copper or mild steel driving band. It seems though as the war went on, yellow became less common and was replaced mostly by red. Some high explosive projectiles were also produced without a tracer to allow more explosive compound to be packed in. This type of round used an impact fuse that was screwed into the nose of the projectile. The way these fuses were manufactured and the designation they receive changed throughout the war but the function remained the same. In the base of the fuse, a small detonator was screwed. I was lucky enough to come across a group of original detonators that were never filled. If you find a shell that has the detonator still attached, be very careful as complete ones are almost impossible to inert. So as you can see the inside of these detonator cups is empty and I should also mention that these have left-handed threads on them. So if we screw one in you can see what a complete and ready-to-go fuse would have looked like. Now on some fuses such as this one you can unscrew the bottom so let's do that and take a look at how these worked. So here we have the two main halves of the fuse, and if you look in the top half, you'll see a little plunger poking out right there. So when the projectile impacted something, the top of the fuse would be crushed and it forced that plunger out of its hole. Now once that plunger was pushed down, it impacted this little piece right here. And this is pointed on one end, so if we can get it out, you'll notice it's basically a little firing pin. Now that firing pin would protrude downwards through that hole in the bottom of the fuse and impact the detonator. Now these fuses actually had a built-in safety mechanism and that's what this little piece of red wound up tape is. Normally when the shell is just sitting around, that tape is coiled up tightly and does not allow the firing pin through the hole. However, once the shell is fired because of centrifugal force, that tape expands outward and allows the firing pin to go through and impact the detonator. Now the Germans didn't want shells that had missed their target to be falling back to earth all over the German countryside and blowing up whatever was in their way, so some shells actually have a built-in self-destruct mechanism. In the bottom of the shell, right where that hole is, there normally would have been a secondary detonator, and that detonator was set off as soon as the fuse had burned all the way through, and I'll throw up a diagram to show you what that would have looked like. Next up we have armor piercing shells, and these were primarily used against ground targets such as trucks and other lightly armored vehicles. And much like high explosive shells, you'll encounter these in several different variations. The body of the round was made of hardened steel and utilized a copper, or in the case of my round, mild steel driving band. Inside the projectile was either an incendiary or high explosive component along with a tracer compound. 
an incendiary round was marked with pH for phosphorus or a Z for high explosive, much like the high explosive rounds indicated by a ring around the projectile base. To ensure these rounds could penetrate as much armor as possible, a nose fuse was not used. Instead, the detonation mechanism was fitted into a fuse in the base of the projectile. Some projectiles, such as mine, have only a tracer and no detonation or self-destruct capabilities. Generally, it is the high explosive armor piercing rounds that have been fitted with a base fuse and or the self-destruct capability. As with standard high explosive rounds, this would be initiated once the tracer had burned all the way through. This type of round also transitioned to a boat tail design as the war went on, but on my example you can see that, just like the high explosive round, the tracer cup is threaded in. So let's go ahead and unscrew that and take a closer look at it. So here is our threaded tracer cup. You can see the compartment where the tracer compound would have originally been, and there is no hole to allow for a self-destruct mechanism. This, just like the detonator cups, uses left-hand threads. Now, along with this, we also have two little metal spacers just to put some more mass between the bottom of the very hot burning fuse and the phosphorus ampule that was contained inside of the projectile. Mine is obviously empty, but that hole is where it would have gone. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the ring around the base of the projectile indicates what color of tracer it would have had. You can also see some markings stamped into the metal, BRX, which is the manufacturer, along with 42 for 1942. And there are the inked in markings, that's the pH. It's a little hard to see because they're a bit faded, but we should have pH and then 148 grams for the weight of the projectile. There is one more armor piercing round I want to mention, the Panzergranata Patron 40. Instead of being made of hardened steel, this round used a tungsten penetrator covered by an aluminum wind cap. It appears the shell was primarily used in the KWK-30, which was a cousin of the Flak-38, and not in the Flak-38 itself. The last type of cartridge that we are going to look at are those that were made for exercise or training purposes. The most common type was the Platz Patronen. It had a hollow wooden projectile that would disintegrate upon exiting the barrel. A special device was also fit to the guns to ensure the breakup of the projectile. Because this round was used in training, the spent cases were collected and sent back to the factory for reloading. To indicate a reloaded case, a cantilever was added towards the bottom. Small dimples located around the cartridge head stamp also seem to indicate reloading. It is unclear if it was added along with the cantilever during the first reloading, or if these were only used to indicate subsequent reloadings. Cases for these rounds were either brass or copper washed steel. Dummy cartridges with no charge were also produced for the Flak 38. These were made of either rubber, bakelite, or machine metal. This type of round would have been used to train the crews in the charging of the weapon or loading of magazines. Now because my casings unfortunately do not have the same dates as the projectiles that I purchased them with, I thought it'd be smart to cover them separately. So when Germany first started producing rounds for the Flag 38, they all used solid brass casings. But gradually after the war started, the need to conserve brass became more and more apparent, so they switched over to a steel casing that was washed with copper. Now eventually, even this copper wash was deemed unnecessary, so they moved on to a just pure lacquered steel. I do not have one of those in my collection, but I'll put up a picture of one to show you what they look like. Here is the head stamp for our early war round. You can see a 1936 state of production right next to one of the old style Waffenamt proof marks, a manufacturer's code, and these primers would have all been sealed with some sort of sealant to keep them watertight. Also notice the little triangle next to the 1936 date, that indicates that at some point in its life this casing was reloaded. Here is our copper washed case. This has a 1942 date, FB manufacturing code, and a Waffenopt in pretty much the same layout as the 1936 dated case. In this one you can also see black primer sealant around it. I should mention that this primer has been chemically deactivated instead of being punched out with something to deactivate it. Before I wrap up this video, I want to mention a few other ammunition-related items that you may encounter. First, we have the charge bags. The powder for the shell was contained within these silk or synthetic bags, and the manufacture of them changed slightly throughout the war. In the bottom of the bag is a small compartment, that's what this is, and what that little slid-in area on that one is, and that contained the uh, igniting charge, and once that igniting charge went off, it set off the main charge and fired the weapon. 
It is not uncommon to find some sort of markings on these powder bags, such as this one, which has a KBY manufacturing stamp and a June 1942 date. Finally, we have a cardboard storage tube. Rounds were kept inside these tubes to prevent them from becoming damaged or knocked around during transport. These tubes would then be packaged inside big wooden crates. The crates normally held around 100 rounds. Well, that concludes part one of this series. I hope you enjoyed this video, and stay tuned for the next one. Thank you.